service. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Here in Job chapter 19, I've always been fascinated with this passage. Notice that first, I'm going to show you this. First, he says, I wish my words were forever. And truly they are, as God decided to put them in His Word, and God's Word is forever. But then He says, I know that my soul is forever, and I'm going to see my Maker one day after I die. Look at it in verse 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Whom shall I see for myself? And mine eyes shall behold. And not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job here is teaching a doctrine that's called eternal security. He's standing in his flesh and he's saying, I know I'm going to die, but I know that my Redeemer liveth. He didn't know the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he had faith of the promise that he would come and redeem him from his sins, paying for every single sin. And he understood that once he was saved, he was always saved. And he had this guarantee, this promise that he looked forward to. I know that my Redeemer liveth. His name is Jesus. And one day he's going to stand on this earth. And if you've already passed, if you've left us, if your spirit has departed, don't worry. He's going to give you a new body. You'll be resurrected at that moment and you will see him with your own eyes. Job is one of the oldest of the penned books. It dates in the same time as Genesis. This doctrine of eternal security, or what I like to call once saved, always saved, is as old as the earth itself. It's as old as the first man, and yet not everyone will receive it. I want to give you some verses tonight about once saved, always saved. Here's the thing. If I'm saved by doing good works, it's never enough because I'm going to fall short. If I can lose my salvation because of bad works, it's never enough because I'm always going to fall short. It tells us in Proverbs that the thought of foolishness is sin. And you could say, I've had a perfect day. I haven't sinned once. And then you dream of winning the lottery or you covet something that belongs to somebody else. That's it, you've sinned. Now you've fallen short and you can no longer enter into heaven if we're saved by works. But listen, we are not saved by works. Therefore, our salvation is eternal. It's 100% in the work that Jesus has finished. It's never been about my work. If I want God's blessing on my life here, then yes, I should obey Him. But if I want to go to heaven, I must believe Him. The gospel is simple and yet, so many people confuse this and muddy it up. I have a lot of verses for you tonight. I'm going to skip some, but let's get started in John 3. If you would, please go to John chapter 3. While you're turning there, let me tell you a story, uh, a real event. This is not a made-up story. Just this past week, I, and I won't tell you the guy's name, he goes to church around here, generally speaking. Uh, we started talking about some stuff. And as it is my nature sometimes we got off course onto what's going on in the politics and the world currency and the mark of the beast and the next thing you know he's talking to me and he didn't know I was a preacher at this point it was a work environment and he's like well let me ask you this how come uh, churches have Halloween when Anton LaVey says isn't it a good thing that even Christian children get to worship Satan one day out of the year and about that time, I'm like, I know, brother, amen, you're preaching to the preacher. And he's like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Okay, and I said, well, well, here's the thing. You know, he says, well, how come all these churches get out there and they have their little fall harvest and they give out candy and they put on witch costumes? And I'm like, amen, brother, not my church. About that time, I gave him a card to our church. And he's like, oh, that's kind of near me, Law of Liberty Baptist. Huh, kind of surprised the Baptist believes that way. You know, and I'm like, well, that's actually traditional Baptist doctrine when, you know, some of these things we're talking about here. Uh, he goes to a church of God in the next town over. His wife is Baptist, he started to tell me, and apparently there was some disagreement there, a little bit of animosity. Our conversation was cut short when she walked in. But prior to her walking in, 
after he made the comment, oh, I'm surprised a Baptist knows all about this kind of stuff, like what's going on in the world. And so I said, well, you go to a church of God, they believe works for salvation. He didn't like that. I said, let me ask you this. You could tell, it, like he physically, physically gave a reaction when I said, you believe in works for salvation. I said, so let me ask you, do you believe Jesus died for all of our sins or do you believe you can lose your salvation? I ask this question this way because I want you to understand either he died for it all and he paid for it all and I'm saved because of him or I can lose it because of me. You can't have both. If you think that Jesus uh, did not die for all of your sins, if you think this is the same, basically saying you have to keep it by doing good works. His response to me, well, are you trying to tell me, and, and it blows my mind, and you, guys have, you guys have had these arguments too, I'm sure, conversations with people that go to an extreme, and that's exactly what this guy did. I mean, we were, we were church-going fellows having a conversation about the world and end times and church and Jesus up to this point. Do you believe Jesus died for all of your sins, or do you think you can lose it? Well, are you trying to tell me you can go out and get drunk and sleep with a whore, and if you die in that moment that you'll still go to heaven? Why do we have to go to such an odd extreme, number one? But are those sins that Jesus didn't die for? Uh, didn't Judah sleep with a harlot? So he perceived? Aren't there people that have committed suicide and murder and drunken, I mean, Abraham, I, I, I'm sorry, Noah, Noah rather, thank you. Noah got drunk. What a sin. How foolish. And something, something horrible happened because of it. And no point did I advocate and say, man, go and live however you want. And you just live a filthy, nasty lifestyle. Do whatever you want. At no point did I say that, but that's their reaction. Why? Because in their own heart, they're trying to keep themselves to the standard of their preacher, which is, don't let me see your sin or I'm going to say you're unsaved. Oh, well, if, I, if I smell your sin from Saturday night when you come in here on Sunday, I'm going to say you've got to get saved all over again. And then what? Well, yeah, and you've got to get baptized all over again doesn't make sense. This doctrine of eternal security, once saved, always saved, is the core foundation of biblical Christianity. Let me tell you, there's a bunch of Christians in the world, not all of them are biblical Christianity. The Catholics openly mock biblical Christianity because they say the Bible is not the authority, their Pope is. Well, they got a problem. They preach a false gospel. But then you get the Church of Christ, the Church of God, the Nazarenes. Help me out, somebody. Name another one. Protestant. Yeah, exactly. Protestant. Boy, that, doesn't that cover a big umbrella? What we would call modern-day evangelicals, most of them are either Arminius or Calvinist. Both believe you can lose your salvation if you're not doing the works. Okay, so biblical Christianity is, I trust in Jesus to get me to heaven because He was perfect and He died for all of my sins. I know I'm not perfect and I, I, mean, I really do want to try to live good for Him. I'm not advocating anybody go live in sin. In fact, doesn't it say that? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we continue? Say, God forbid. Don't live like that. Don't do that. You'll destroy yourself. This doctrine is a foundation. If you have a pen, I want you to write some of these down. I've got a lot of verses. I'm going to, I'm going to move as, as quickly as I can without causing any confusion. Um, I, I, if you want the list when I'm done, I'll be glad to give it to you. This is in no way exhaustive. I had to cut many out. I want to give you several good verses proving once saved, always saved. It's called eternal security. We're saved just by faith without any works. John 3.16, the most famous. You guys are there? Let's take a look at it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves you. He gave Jesus that paid for all of your sins. Therefore, if you trust in Him, if you just believe in Him, that's all that's required. You will not perish. You will not go to hell. Instead, you have everlasting life. How long does everlasting life last for? Forever and ever and ever. In fact, doesn't the verse right before it in verse 15 call it eternal life? 
Doesn't it say the same thing in John 3, 36? It's everlasting life. You can never lose it. This is the best news. This is the good news. I want you to understand, Paul warned about those that would preach another gospel, one of works. That is not a gospel. Gospel means good news. If I came to any one of you and I said, you have to stop all the sin. No smoking and joking and drinking and cussing. You can't have bad thoughts. You can't, I mean, you got to tie your shoelaces right. You better write your cursive perfect. No sin or you're not saved. Man, that's impossible. God knows that. He loves us. And the good news is, believe in Jesus, you're saved forever. It's that simple. Now, many have a false Jesus. We're not talking about that tonight. We're talking about the Jesus of the Bible. 100% God, 100% man, walked the earth perfect and sinless, laid down His life for us, paid for every sin debt for every per person, made it easily available. He says it right here, whosoever believeth, that's anybody that trusts in Jesus, you're saved forever. That's His guarantee. That's good news. That's awesome. Go to John 6. Go to John chapter 6. Once you have everlasting life, you cannot undo it. Otherwise, it's not everlasting life. If I gave you an everlasting light bulb and you put it in and you screwed it in and it came on and it's on forever. I mean, when the power goes out, the bulb's still on. 100 years from now, it's still going. A million years from now, if it's truly an everlasting light bulb, it's still going. I mean, they could bulldoze the building and plant something. It's like there's still a light bulb there and it's still shining because it's everlasting. When God says everlasting, He doesn't mean, well, just for this age or just for this decade or until you sin again. God forbid, if it was based on when you, until you sin again, none of us would probably even make it out of the room. We'd all be in trouble. John 6, look at verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Does that say in no wise cast out? Hey, hey. You come to Jesus, He will not cast you out for any reason, period. It's done. You come unto Him, it's done. He'll never cast you out of His family. In this same chapter, look at verse 47. John 6, verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on Me hath everlasting life. There it is again. Go to John 10. Everlasting life lasts forever. It's the gift of God and man, oh man, without it, this world, we are in trouble. We're all sinners. We're all distracted by our own cares. We don't live for God like we ought to. We don't talk to Him like we ought to. We don't worship Him like we ought to. But salvation is not based on any of those things. Those are relational. If my children don't arise and call me blessed every day, they're still my children. If my children <coughs> forget to tell me thank you for a meal, they're still my children. If my children disobey me, they're still my children. John chapter 10, if you would, find verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You're in God's hand, and He says, I will not pluck you out. You're always there. I'm not going to take you out. But He says, neither can any man. Well, that includes yourself. Once you're in God's hand, you cannot take yourself out. Go to the next chapter, chapter 11. No one can take you out of God's hand. That's His promise. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in Me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Notice the requirement. There's two requirements for salvation. Uh, one, you have to still be alive on this earth. And then you've got to believe in Jesus. If you die in unbelief, it's too late from the grave or really from hell. You can't say, I believe now. I'm sorry. It's too late. You have to put your trust in him now while you're alive. Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. My favorite verse in the whole Bible, it, this is a package deal. It has everything you need to know about the gospel right here. The last verse in Romans, verse 23, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. The wage, that's the payment you've earned. Sin, breaking God's law. Death, he's talking about hell. Death and hell, right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A gift is free, right? If I said, hey, I'm going to give you my flashlight. 
here you go, just give me one dollar. If you have to pay for it, it's not a gift. If I say, here, I'm gonna give you my flashlight, go wash my truck, and I've been on dirt roads this week, it's filthy, right? Or hey, I've got four kids, it's filthy on the inside too, right? It doesn't matter. If you do any work, it's not free. If you pay for it, it's not free. A free gift is, here you go, no strings attached, you don't have to call me and tell me you love me, you don't have to come to my house, you either take the gift or you don't. The gift of God is eternal life that lasts forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything's there about Him. He's the Son of Man, He's the Son of God, and He's the Messiah. If you don't believe in Him, you go to hell. You will receive the wages of sin, which is death. Go to Galatians chapter 2. We're going to skip one or two. Let me, well, yeah, you guys go to Galatians 2. Let me read a couple for you. Romans 8. Verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 is that promise that nothing will separate us from God. Now here's the thing, if you're saved and you choose to disobey God and go into sin, you know, you may lose uh, His blessing on your life. You may lose your health. You may lose the protection that God has, that, that hedge of protection. You may lose a position of ministry. You may lose your family. You may lose your life. There's a lot of things that you can actually lose by sinning, but the one thing you can never lose is salvation because salvation means Jesus paid for every single sin you'll ever commit. You'll never be separated from the love of Christ. Romans 11 says, And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise work is no more work. You can't have both grace and works. No, no, grace means gift. Grace is the gift of God. That's salvation that He gives to you and you don't deserve it. Well, I worked for it. No one, no one can stand before God and say, I deserve to be here when we go to heaven. Galatians 2, this is important. Look at verse 16, please. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we get justified? I, I've heard it. The best one I like was that it's just as if I'd never sinned, right? Just as if I'd never sinned. Well, if I never sinned, I get to go to heaven, right? Well, that's how it is. There's no perfect people, just one. They killed him. So he says, we're justified Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And I'm here to tell you, if you're saved, uh, there, no one will be condemned to hell because of their sin either, if you're already saved. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? Look, you can sin and ruin your life, but when you stand before God, He's not going to bring up your sins and remind you what He paid for. No, they're already paid for. You can lose your eternal rewards if you continue in sin, but you'll never lose your salvation. Go to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse number four, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. If you think you're saved by keeping the law, or you think you can lose your salvation by breaking the law, you are fallen from grace. You don't have the gift, you don't have the gift of God, which is eternal life. Go to Ephesians chapter one, not too far away. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse number 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, what happened after you believed? Well, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You understand, Christianity is the only religion that teaches that God will dwell with you. Uh, the Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us and He seals us. We are permanently protected and sealed by that Holy Spirit. Uh, so the analogies, I'll use analogies when I try to preach the gospel to somebody. Um, if you had a can of white paint and the lid was on, it was sealed, and you throw it into the mud, well, it's dirty on the outside, but it's still clean on the inside. Well, that's you. You're clean on the inside because Jesus already paid for all those sins. Now, you're going to have some problems on the outside in this filthy world as we stumble and fall and give in to temptation and distractions. There's so many distractions that are out there. I mean, cell phones, I think the devil uses cell phones probably more than any other tool this age, doesn't he? You can't even hardly talk to somebody. I was talking to somebody trying to preach the gospel to them. They got an earbud in their ear the whole time. It's like, what are you listening to? I've finally come to the point where I just say, hey, take that out of your ear. Uh, why don't you turn off that TV, step outside, turn that off, get the distractions away. And I, I think it's important to do that because uh, we come in the authority. Jesus has all authority on earth, and he's given us all authority in the gospel. And if they take it very seriously, then they will close the door, take out the earbud, turn off the phone, whatever it is that's distracting them. I had one guy that even after like a few minutes, he's like, well, i got somebody on the phone. I'm like, so they're listening. Well, then you can put it on speakerphone and they can listen too. But don't have them whispering in your ear as a distraction, you know? And if somebody won't stop that, then they're not going to listen to you anyway. I've had people say, no, okay, well, I'm just not interested right now. Well, I'd rather, you, I'd rather find out now. You're in Ephesians chapter 1. Look, he says that we are, he says, After that ye believe, verse 13, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. He bought your soul. He owns you. Now, He owns your flesh also, but it's your soul one day that will be redeemed. You'll be resurrected. So until then, just remember, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith. There it is. What's it say? Saved through faith. Can't be any clearer. You're not saved by anything else other than what you choose to believe about Jesus. You're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves... It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not because I'm better than you, and that's where people get off. Well, listen, I've turned my life around, and I quit all that stuff, the smoking and joking and drinking and cussing, and I go to church, and I pay my bills, and I pay my taxes, and I take care of my family, and I'm a good person. It's like, yeah, I hear you talking about your many wonderful works, and he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you because you're trusting in your own works. We're saved through faith. And once you're saved, you're always saved. Go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't say, uh, grieve not your preacher when he's preaching to you. If you ignore the preaching of the Word of God, you're dealing with the Holy Spirit. That's who's going to be upset with you. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Well, where's He at? He says, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. He's inside of you. You're sealed unto that day of the resurrection when this body falls away, just as Job said, yet shall I see God. We're going to rise again. If you would go to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. Let me give you a couple while you're turning there. In Philippians 1, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He started a good work in you, and he's going to keep working on you until that day of the resurrection. Titus 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie 
promised before the world began. We have a hope of eternal life. God said, I will not lie. So when God says, believe on Jesus and you're saved, He can't lie. I mean, this is good news. We're trusting in a God that doesn't lie. Unlike the God of, of Mohammedism, Allah, shady, telling you to lie to people. So many religions, their God is a false God, a crooked God. Not the God of the Bible. There is a difference. Not all gods are the same. Not all uh, holy books lead to the same direction. Not all religions are the same. This is important. This is a distinction. We believe in the God that does not lie. We believe in the God whose name is truth. That's the God I'm trusting in. Titus 3, 5, he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. We're not saved by works. It's all by His mercy. Now, you're in 1 Peter chapter 1, right? Find verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. There's that concept, we're born again. We're born in the flesh. Now you have to be born in the Spirit when you trust in Christ. He says, begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that's in heaven. It's not land here. We're not looking for a holy patch of dirt here. We're looking for reigning with Christ. He says, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. God has a place for you in eternity, and it is reserved. And He's not going to break the reservation. He cannot lie. He's made the promise. There's a place for you. In fact, didn't He tell us in my Father's house or many mansions? If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. He's preparing us a place. We have a reservation in His uh, millennial kingdom, perhaps in that new Jerusalem, or there's a mansion inside of that just for you. It's your own place. You're building it now. He says, look at it, he says at the end of verse 4, uh, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice he didn't say you have to keep your own salvation by keeping the law. He says, God has you kept. It's finished. You're saved. Go to Hebrews 6. This is an important one. This is one that's often misquoted or misused, taken out of context to teach that you can lose your salvation. But the simple fact is, it's actually teaching that you cannot lose it. Never. If I love Hebrews 10. We won't look at it today, but he says, once and for all, at the end of 10.10, once and for all, once you're saved, it's for all. It's forever, right? Uh, you're going to Hebrews 6. Look at verse number 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. You know, he says elsewhere that uh, he, Christ died once and for all. Right. So what's he talking about here? There are those that may fall away that never turn back and live for God. But what it does not say is they lost their salvation and they went to hell. There is no verses that teach that. You'll have people that, uh, what's the concept, where they strain at a gnat. Now, it's interesting. He says they were enlightened, well, were, were lighted by Christ. They have the heavenly gift. Well, that's salvation. They're partakers of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost moves inside of you, once you're sealed, it says you're sealed unto the day of redemption. They've tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. They fall away to renew them again unto repentance. That's why the warning is, uh, don't get off track. There are some Christians that become what the Bible calls a castaway. Once they go so far off track with God, they go down that path of a sin unto death and they just ruin their life. They squander their blessings. They get outside of the God of will, the, the will of God, and it's hard for them to ever come back. They end up destroying themselves. Uh, go to Hebrews 13, please. Hebrews chapter 13.
Let your conversation, I'm sorry, verse 5, I want you to bear with me. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. We read this this morning in the morning service. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Once God moves inside, he's always there with you. If you ignore him, that's on you, but he's still there. Salvation is still there. The Spirit is still present. Uh, if you would, go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. While you're going there, let me read 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. He says, it doesn't appear yet what we're going to be. We can't see our spiritual body yet, but it's there. It's already happened. When God says it's happened, it's as good as already completed. You're in 1 John chapter 5. Find verse number 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If you ever have anybody that says, no, you can lose it, you take them right here and say, wait a minute. The victory over this world is our faith by believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you don't believe that, you don't have the victory yet, and you have not overcome this world to get into the next. In fact, look at verse 13. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. God wants you to know it right now. It's obtainable. It's easy. It's by faith. You don't have to work hard to get saved. Maybe you have to work real hard and figure out that you've believed a bunch of lies that by being good somehow you can get to heaven and you've got to, as it says in Hebrews 4, enter into His rest. Finally, go to Jude, if you would, the book of Jude. There's only one chapter. While you're going there, let me read Ecclesiastes 3, verse 14. This is Old Testament. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before Him. When God does something, it's finished, it's done. When He saves you, you're saved forever. In Jude, obviously chapter 1, look at verse 22. And of some have compassion making a difference, right? How do we get people saved? Sometimes we need to love them and make a difference in their life. Look at the next verse. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by flesh. Sometimes you got to show people the fear of the Lord and help them understand where their sin is taking them to hell. You have to preach hell fire and help them to understand that. Look at verse... 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Do you see what he says? He is able to keep you from falling in this life and ruining your life and to present you faultless. Now think about that. When you stand in heaven, before the Lord, He will present you sinless, faultless. You have plenty of faults, shortcomings, sins, transgressions, iniquities, right? You've broken the law, but He will present you faultless. God has the power to present you faultless. What an awesome promise. It doesn't say He's going to stop you from sinning. He can keep you from falling if you listen to Him. But if you get distracted and listen to the wrong people, well, then you'll probably fall in this life. But you'll never fall from grace if you're saved by faith. You've fallen from grace if you think you're saved by works. He says, 
He will present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. The good news of the gospel is simple. It's that it is simply forever and ever and ever. It will never stop. Anyone that dabbles with uh, repent of your sins, you have to turn from your sins to be saved, that's a heresy. It's also called lordship salvation. Well, if you don't make him the Lord of your life and obey everything he says, then he's not your savior. That's heresy. That's work salvation. Those two things are essentially the same thing by many names and many other occults. Even the Mormons, I spent, or not Muslims, I spent 45 minutes talking to a Muslim guy one time. And I was asking him all these questions and asking him to show me his scripture. And I was giving him scripture and giving him answers. And one of the things he said that he kept going back to, if we repent of our sins, Allah might accept us. The Mormons teach they have to turn from their sins. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they teach that you have to turn from your sins. The world is full of this false gospel. I want you to understand, listen, you're saved by faith, and once you're saved, you're always saved. That is the gospel. If anybody wavers on that, oh, Brother Luke got a tract. What church was that from? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Emmanuel Baptist Church, the one out here. They put two tracts on his door. One said, just believe in Jesus and you're saved. What did the other one say? It says you had to repent of all your sins to be saved. Well, now that's confusing, isn't it? Why would you put out two separate Gospels? One that says you have to do the works, and the other one says, well, it's just by believing. This is where the Southern Baptist Convention has gone. This is where every mainstream church has gone. You start naming the fancy rock and roll churches in town, your 1122s. That's exactly what they teach. And they're not shy about it at all. They publish it. You have to repent of your sins. That's what 1122 teaches. The guy's a Calvinist. He says, if you don't have any works in your life, then you're not saved. That's the Catholic gospel. That's not gospel. That's not good news. If, if my salvation is based on my good life, then I've earned it. Why do I need Jesus? Think about it. He will present me faultless. He alone can present me faultless. Ecclesiastes 8, he says, Though a sinner do an evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him. God's forgiveness is forever and ever. Yep. Once He has given you the gift of God, which is eternal life, once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're adopted into the family forever. He will not kick you out, but He'll sure uh, correct you at times. I remind you our opening verse, Job 19, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job had great confidence in God's salvation. It was not in his good works. Job knew for a fact that God made a promise and He would keep it. And I want you to have that same confidence. Don't listen to somebody that says you have to be sorry for all of your sins to be saved. Or you have to be willing to turn from all of your sins to be saved. That's impossible to turn from your sins. The good news is it's a joyful thing that He's paid for it all. And all we have to do is take that gift. Boy, praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much. Lord, I pray that You would help these Scriptures to go deep in our heart. Help us to be able to use them to give an answer to anybody that's confused on this and thinks they have to do good works or repent of their sins to be able to keep their salvation. Lord, I believe You when You say it's forever. And I believe that You will not lie to us, trick us, or deceive us. Lord, I know that we are weak in our human flesh. And I pray that you would help us to remember that we're rewarded and blessed when we obey you. Lord, I thank you for the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.